Hi there, everybody, and uh, good afternoon or good morning, wherever this uh, webinar finds you. This is uh, Dave Staus. I'm a partner here at Hush Blackwell in their Denver office and co-leader of Hush's Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice Group. Joining me here today is uh, Bob Bowman, who I know many of you have heard from in the past on these webinars. And also joining us here today is uh, Malia Rogers uh, in the Denver office as well. Um, listen, we're, we're excited to uh, give this presentation to you uh, today. As you know, it's in the title block there. We're less than 60 days now until the CCPA goes into effect, or about you know, six and a half weeks, give or take, into the January 1st effective date. It's hard to believe that Thanksgiving is so close. It's hard to believe that Christmas is so close and the holidays, uh, but it's that time of year again. Um, so, uh, you know, before I begin and we dig into this is, uh, if you've listened to our webinars before, you know, we've got a little bit of uh, housekeeping stuff to do. What I'll say to you is um, feel free to ask questions. We have a lot of content here today. Um, we will get to your questions if we can. If we cannot, we will follow up, follow up via email afterwards. I think, you know, people have asked questions in the past No that um, are pretty good, I think, about getting responses to the questions um, that you have to you, even if it's on, you know, late Saturday nights or early Sunday mornings. We've, we've, we've been known to jam up your inbox with the questions. But feel free to ask them. Uh, you know, if we can get to them, great. If not, you know, we'll try our best to get around to it. Um, you know, as far as uh, we always get the question as well about whether the slide deck is going to be available and the recording is going to be available. Yes, you should be able to access the slide deck on the platform you have here. And the recording is always uh, available to anybody who's registered. You'll get an email afterwards that will uh, provide you with access to the recording if for some reason you just really want to hear from us again, talk through, through these issues. So if you um, have attended our webinars in the past, you know that the way we like to start off these webinars is with a roadmap. The, the reason I like to do this is, uh, you know, you know where we're going in the presentation, uh, so you can kind of anticipate, even for your questions, right, anticipate about where we're going and what we're going to talk about. Um, we've got eight topics today. It may look overwhelming, but it's an hour, and we're going to charge through these as quickly as possible. I want to emphasize something, though, before we begin, is this is the sixth CCPA webinar that we've done since March. Uh, many of you have attended, uh, you know, some or all of those prior webinars. Um, you know, you, you may know that we recently did one last month on the regulations, and the month before that we did it on the amendments to the CCPA. Um, I've always viewed these webinars as an ongoing discussion that we're having with people who attend them. And, you know, starting in March, we started with the compliance issues, and then we took it through, you know, some exceptions and then the amendments and the regulations. And, and I say that because... You know, today's webinar is very much um, focused on this aspect of, of where we are with compliance, being 60 days out, um, well, less than 60 days out from, from compliance. And what we're really going to try to do is continue that discussion and identify these things that we think that you need to uh, be focusing on to drive compliance in the next few weeks here to get it across the finish line. What I will say is if you are sitting there saying, well, hey, I, I want more content, I want more about, you know, what the CCK says on this and the other things, we've got so many resources available to you um, that, we're, you know, feel free to explore those during the webinar. If you go to hushblackwell.com slash CCPA, we've got white papers, we've got um, blog posts, we've got alerts, we've got third-party articles, and in particular, I'd encourage you to to take a look at the, the blog, fightbacklaw.com, to subscribe to it. That's really where I view our running conversation with people um, about all these laws as they're coming into effect, CCPA, and, and frankly, you know, other state privacy laws that we're going to start seeing pop up, I think, in the next legislative session. Also available to you uh, through that webpage, I mentioned all the webinars we've done in the past. Here they are, and you can even, you know, link to them here. Don't listen to them now. That would be insulting if you jumped onto a different webinar when we are still talking to you. But these are the prior ones. Uh, so if you have questions about, hey, what did the regs say or what did the amendments, you know, what happens with the amendments, we, we talked about that, right? Um, and so I would encourage you to take a look at those as well. Um, I also say, so we're getting, you know, we're getting a note from our administrator that um, if, you're, if you're not seeing the webinar slide deck right now, 
Uh, go ahead and press F5 to refresh your screen. Um, you should be seeing the webinar screen right now, uh, so go ahead and do that. Uh, and if, if you're not, in fact, seeing the webinar screen. So, um, you know, to dive into the topics then without further ado, the, the first topic we really want to talk about is, is organizational factors, right? And again, we're trying to issue spot here. We're trying to drive you through what we think you need to, to, to be thinking about in the next few weeks uh, to drive compliance. And the starting point really is this concept of business in the CCPA. Um, if you've attended a prior webinar, you've probably seen this slide deck before, and I imagine that you know if you're on this webinar, you, you you've wrestled with this concept already, right? I mean, you know, it, it, the CCPA covers businesses; it's 25 million or more in annual gross revenues, and um, you know, and all these other categories as well, right? What I want to focus on though is a conversation we're having with clients these days about these categories here, and that is paragraph two of the definition of business, right? So you've got that. Paragraph one is what I showed you in the prior slide. Paragraph two is this. The definition also includes any entity that controls or is controlled by a business that, that shares common branding with the business. And if you look at the common, or the control or controlled and the common branding definition, these are it from statute here, which is sort of broken down into subheadings. Um, what I will say is for complex corporate structures, the common control is not a problem, right? And think about like your organizational chart and you know, think about the parent company, all the subsidiaries and all that type of stuff. The common control is not typically the issue, right? It's the common branding that is becoming the issue about whether you can consider even you know, subsidiaries or related companies under the same corporate umbrella to be one business or separate businesses. It ends up coming down to this common branding um, definition, and that's you know from the statute right there. It's a shared name, service mark, or trademark. And the perspective, and I think the, the the point of view that you need to be thinking about is, it is the the CCPA doesn't care about your corporate structure. The CCPA cares about what an ordinary consumer would think of when they come to interact with a business. Would that consumer know that by interacting with business A? It's in fact also transferring personal information to business B that has a separate brand name, right? And yeah, it may be under the same corporate umbrella, but they may not in fact know that because they don't know your corporate structure, right? And so the CCPA comes about it from the point of view of the consumer itself, not from your corporate structure. And sort of like tease this out a little bit. So here's just a obviously a made up um, company, um, although maybe some of you will anticipate where the names come from on this one. This is, you know, just think about this as a parent company, right? Wayne Enterprises, uh, yeah, it's Batman, right? So uh, Bob's giving me a laugh right now. <laughs> now <whether. laughs> so Wayne Enterprises, right? So the, and view that as the parent company, right? And so everything in blue under Wayne Enterprises has the same branding, right? Wayne Co. and Wayne Co. Operating Entity, right? That has the same branding and common control, so it's a business, right? When you look underneath this, when you look at Stark Industries and LexCorp, right, and you see the red and the green here, this is what we're trying to drive after, is it's branded differently. And so when you look at the definition of business, you really need to try to hash through these issues to figure out whether or not these can be the same business or separate businesses. Okay, so I think you get that concept. Let, let me then talk about one more issue before I turn it over to Bob to talk about inventorying. And that's this website issue. And this is a conversation we're having with clients really at, at the get-go, right? And the concept here is we think about companies and we think about them as having, you know, one website, hushblackwell.com, right, would be the one for Hush. A lot of companies, though, have many different websites. And I'm not talking about, hey, your marketing team has gone out and, you know, taken your name and added, you know, an E to the end of it or change the letter or something like that to try to avoid people from, you know, having websites that are, are mimicking your website. We're not talking about that. What we're talking about is entities that are, you know, selling products and because they're selling products, they have many different websites to try to drive consumers to their products, right? So this is one of the first questions that I think you need to ask as you're trying to drive compliance with your marketing team, with your IT team is, how many websites do we have? How many unique URLs do we have? Get me a list of those, and let's start trying to figure out, A, you know, that issue of business, right, and how that fits in, 
but B, what, what are we saying to the world as far as our privacy policies and our notices go, right? Do you have a privacy policy on all these websites? Can they share privacy policies under the CCPA? Or do we need those to be different privacy policies? Are there, is there a reason why, you know, website one, which is branded differently, may want to have a different privacy policy than website two, right? And you need to do this at the beginning. You need to be thinking about this in the next couple of weeks because, you know, you're going to be needing to draft to stand up the methods of receiving requests and to be drafting your privacy policies. And if you don't actually have a list of what's out there and what you're actually going to need to be doing as, you know, to stand this up, then you're going to be in a, in a difficult situation. Okay, and you know, and, and we've got also the, the methods of receiving requests because that's a big aspect of what, what Malia is going to talk about in a little bit um, about how you receive requests and really tasking your IT team. You know, I would say, leave you with nothing else today in this like to-do list type of presentation we're giving you is you need to get with your IT team, with your website team. You need to start talking about these things now, right? And then the same questions for mobile applications as well. All right, good. So let me turn it over then to the inventory page. And just, you know, in case um, I, I noticed before about the, the refresh screen, you hopefully are all seeing uh, a slide that says inventory right now, a blue screen with the word inventory on it. If not, press F5, it'll get you updated on the slide deck. With that, and I apologize for the technical issues, I will hand it over to Bob who can take you through this issue. <laughs> Uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks again for attending. So I'm going to kind of just um, get into some of the aspects about inventorying data. Um, you know, essentially the data inventory tracks data flow into and out of your business. Uh, from our perspective, I think uh, now and moving forward, this is really going to be the heart of your compliance efforts. Um, as the results of these inventories form the basis for your privacy policy, uh, your consumer disclosures, and data processing agreements. Um, and, and it also will affect, you know, we see a landscape uh, evolving where there's going to be multiple states that have different requirements. And so having and keeping track of this inventory, updating that inventory for specific state requirements, I think. Uh, from our perspective, is going to be, as I said, you know, the central uh, driver for your compliance efforts moving forward. So the purpose of the inventory is to make accurate disclosures. Uh, oh, sorry, I need to advance the slide. Um, sorry. So the, you know, so the purpose is to make accurate disclosures, uh, respond to requests accurately and efficiently. Identify sales. Um, again, you know, if you've been on our uh, webinars before, a sale does not mean sale as we would uh, think about it. Uh, another important aspect is to identify service providers and or third party relationships. Um, that will go to future compliance when uh, California consumers start exercising their rights. You know, whether uh, a third party is designated a service provider um, or a third party. Uh, controls how you can treat that request and what obligations those third parties have uh, to, your, to your consumers. Um, and then an important thing is by getting an accurate uh, picture of the data that you have collected, it helps us identify uh, personal information that is exempted. So whether it falls under another uh, regulatory um, regime like the GLBA or HIPAA, um, or whether it falls under one of the exemptions that has recently been enacted in the, in the latest revision in, in September. So uh, I'm going to start, you know, so what, what if we're just starting or we haven't started uh, our inventories? You know, one thing that you know, we just kind of want to reinforce is what's realistic to accomplish by January 1st uh, if you haven't started. You know, I think um, getting the high level, identifying the higher risk uh, pieces of data that you collect, uh, a targeted um, inventory of the departments which have the more um, sensitive or the more um, uh, pieces of personal information that might expose you to risk. You know, I think that's realistic to, compl to accomplish. Uh, a comprehensive um, 
data inventory of your entire organization, depending on its size, may not be realistic. Um, but, you know, that's just where we're at, being less than 60 days away from, from compliance. Um, so data inventories, you know, a lot of our clients uh, try and do internal inventories, um, and some want to use third-party platforms. Uh, you know, Dave will get in this a little later, shameless plug, but we've developed our own uh, data inventory tool, uh, which is specifically set up to drive compliance with CCPA and privacy laws, and we can describe that a little bit later. Um, and then the other important feature is, is the selection of the right departments and the scope of that inventory within the department. You know, um, we see uh, probably the marketing departments are the ones that you wouldn't think hold the greatest trove of personal information, um, or at least have the greatest trove of personal information that other people in the organization don't know that they have, um, just by the nature of their business, especially if they're performing a lot of internet-based marketing. Um, you know, they're collecting, they're, they're hiring uh, service providers that put cookies on your webpage and, and on, um, collect information when people visit your site. So, um, you know, the ability to adapt the process inventory for future use, I think that I mentioned that at the beginning. You know, the CCPA um, has an evergreen requirement. Essentially, it requires you to update your privacy policy every 12 months. Um, that also incorporates a 12-month look-back period um, and, and the 12-month kind of consideration and the notices that you uh, provide um, if, if necessary. The other um, thing that we foresee is the CCPA 2.0, um, which may keep you... Uh, having to hear our voice for, for another year and, and additional webinars. There's uh, Alistair McTaggart uh, initiated a new ballot measure um, this fall uh, to change some of the shortcomings that he saw in the, in the law that was passed and finalized in September. Um, so we wouldn't be surprised if there's a CCPA 2.0 next year. And then other state privacy laws, so Washington, uh, Illinois, Texas, all of those states um, had at some level varying degrees of legislation that, that adapted or was directed towards privacy uh, and consumer privacy. So, um, you know, there's going to be a changing landscape, and we think uh, selecting the right tool and getting things aligned now will help save money and save effort moving forward. Um, I'll move on to the next slide here. Um, so one of the things is, is we think you should identify an owner uh, of the process. So consider assigning um, an internal inventory manager who's kind of the point person for all that. Uh, spend time concentrating on what you need to inventory and why. Uh, identify what departments collect and share data, you know, your marketing department, your HR, uh, customer service, uh, whether you have a customer database. And then, you know, finally with the inventory, our, our advice right now is to start somewhere. You know, try and figure out which department uh, may have the, the largest collection of personal information and start there. Um, you know, the marketing department is a good place to start. Uh, uh, user accounts or, and, and registration if you have an interactive uh, web page that, that collects users and um, they have a registration page would be, you know, kind of another place. So. Um, so let's say you've, you've finished your inventory, so now what? You know, review the classifications. So review what you've collected in view of the new exemptions that were implemented in October. Um, there's a business to business, employee, and uh, the revised FCRA. So, you know, those sorts of exemptions um, weren't, may not have been around when you took your initial inventory, so we want to update for that. You know, on that, Bob, it's, I think it's worth noting. So, for you know, I know we've got a number of GLBA financial institutions on the webinar, um, and this is this is exactly the point, right? If you go through your inventory and identify things as being GLBA, not GLBA, this revised SCRA exemption really expanded it beyond the concept of sale to a, a much broader spectrum. So, it's something really that if you if you feel like you're done, you may want to take another look back at that because. You know, if you had to respond to a, a, a request to know uh, or request to delete, and you're going to be identifying your exemptions, you you know, it's worth putting that one in there as well, if it's applicable. But that's a big one to take a look at. Oh. 
I got ahead. So, um, you know, the other thing we suggest is identify uh, personal information that you can't turn over. Um, there's a little bit of uh, a conflict between the statute and the, and the draft regulations. The draft regulations specifically identified pieces of information that you should not uh, turn over, uh, such as social security numbers and other uh, you know, sensitive identifying information. Um, and new definitions of categories and sources and categories of third parties. Make sure you've looked uh, those over and, uh, and added that, those elements to your data inventory. Um, and then finally, uh, implement um, an ever, the evergreen procedure. So, you know, think about uh, implementing internal policies and procedures to make sure that those, that your data inventories, your privacy policies, your notices are all updated on a, on a yearly basis. Now I'll turn it over to Malia to uh, provide some description on receiving requests. Thanks, Bob. So I just want to go back to something Bob mentioned at the outset of, of the data inventory discussion, which is that the data inventory is really to drive compliance with responding to consumer requests um, in addition to having the correct disclosures in your privacy notice. So as a refresher, come January 1, California residents are going to be able to submit requests under the CCPA, which include the right to know, the right to delete, and to the extent you're selling their personal information to third parties, the right to opt out of that sale. So a business's obligation when it comes to consumer requests is really twofold. Sorry, we'll just advance the slide. So the obligation is twofold, being first, you need to set up intake methods for these requests, and second, you're going to have to be replying within certain time frames and with certain information pursuant to the CCPA. So we'll tackle these in turn, but as Dave emphasized earlier, the point is really to get your IT team or web services team involved, involved now, especially as we're nearing the end of the year. And you might be coming across code freezes or other, other hurdles that maybe were not anticipated when it comes to complying with the CCPA. So first, the required methods for your business um, when it comes to intaking these consumer requests is going to depend on certain factors. The type of request being to know, to delete, to opt out. The manner in which you're interacting with your customers. Um, the CCPA is, the, is driving the idea that you know, businesses shouldn't be setting up obscure methods to intake these requests in, in an effort to discourage consumers to exercise these rights. Um, you need to consider whether you have just an online presence or whether you're communicating with these consumers in brick and mortar stores or over the telephone or by direct mail. Um, and there's certain considerations um, under the CCPA when it comes to password protected account holders versus um, just general consumers who are visiting your website or location. And as we go through this, um, just keep in mind that the CCPA is trying to minimize the administrative burden on consumers. And so when you're thinking about your own compliance efforts, um, keep that in mind. Okay, so sorry, I hope you're on the next slide here for requests to know. So the regulations, um, the proposed regulations really provide the most guidance when it comes to the methods by which businesses are going to have to provide these intake forms or other mediums for the different consumer requests. So when it comes to requests to know, there need to be two or more methods available to consumers um, at minimum a toll-free number has to be set up. There's no direction as to whether that has to go to a live person, whether it can be an automated um, answering service, um, but this needs to be set up to the extent you don't already have a customer service line. To the extent you operate a website, the regulations are requiring, as well as the CP, C, CCPA, that you have an interactive web form where consumers can submit these requests. 
So thought needs to go in now as to what information you're going to be collecting in those web forms in order to be responding to these requests. There are other methods that are listed, <clears throat> um, but these are not exhaustive. So a designated email address, if you have brick and mortar stores having printed out forms, or directing folks to your website where they can complete this, in, this submission, um, also allowing people to mail in forms. And again, thinking back to how you're interacting primarily with your consumers. And additionally, the regulations go so far as to say that three methods may be required. So to the extent you're online, you need to have that interactive web form. At minimum, you're going to have to have that toll-free number. But to the extent, for example, you have brick and mortar stores, um, particularly in California, then you need to consider some of the other methods um, that I just mentioned. And just to, just to jump in here real quick, so I mean, to, to Malia's point, right, on this interactive web form, if you are sitting there and you're in legal and you have responsibility for driving CCPA compliance and you haven't talked with your IT team yet on putting up this interactive web form, send the email now. It's going to be something that's going to take them to time to develop. And as Malia mentioned, when we're talking with a lot of clients right now at the year end and there's you know IT freezes and those types of things and there's a lot of your if you're direct to consumer, there might be uh, the busy time of year, uh, obviously with the holidays coming up and people making a lot of purchases, don't assume that that's something that you can get done overnight. And the secondary point that Malia made as well is once you say you know, to IT, hey, we need a web form, the response is going to be, well, what does it need to do and what does it need to say? And so you're going to have to very quickly be standing up that, you know, that process and thinking through that. And again, you know, when Bob was talking about you know, what's realistic January 1 to get across the finish line, this is one of those things that you're going to have to, you know, regardless of the fact that the regs don't go into effect, uh, you know, the, the AG can't enforce this until uh, July 1st, 2020. This is one of those things where as of January 1st, consumers are going to be able to make these requests and they have to be able in the position to make these requests. So you got to stand it up. This has to be a high priority item for you to stand up this, this capability. And as Bob's going to talk about in a, in a minute as well, the privacy policies as well and having those online. So requests to delete are similar to requests to know requirements in the sense that you need to have two or more methods. However, the regs and CCPA are not prescriptive here as to what methods you use for deletion. Obviously, to gain some efficiency to the extent you have that toll-free number in a web form, that will likely make sense for handling your request to delete. Um, there's also no direction or limitations as to these forms. They they could be provided in one interactive web form, uh, allowing consumers all these options. And that's probably just uh, a business decision you have to make by providing these all, all at once to your consumers. Um, but similarly, they you know, acknowledge the same type of methods, a toll-free telephone number, an interactive web form, or in-person um, forms that people can mail in or submit. Um, similarly here, though, you need to consider the primary methods in which you're interacting with your consumers and ensuring that these methods are, are available. Um, also, when it comes to requests to delete, something to note with this intake method is that for these submissions, it requires a two-step process if this is a submission that's being done online, for example, through that interactive web form. The requirement is for the consumer to clearly submit a request and then separately confirm that they want that information to be deleted. And the thought here is just to avoid any accidental requests or um, to correct such requests because deletion is obviously irrevocable here. And to the extent you are selling a consumer's personal information to a third party, you need to, if you have a website, have this do not sell my personal information link on your website. There's also the option to have the truncated do not sell my info, and that's just thinking about your mobile web enabled websites or applications 
um, so that formatting is a little easier to read. Um, the regs went a little bit further to account for businesses that aren't operating exclusively online. And so to the extent um, you have offline or uh, brick and mortar stores, you need to be thinking about um, another method. But regardless, offline, online, you need to have two or more designated methods. And to the extent you're online, it must have this do not sell my information link. Again, the consideration is how you're primarily interacting with your consumers. We've listed again here the, the options. Um, what's new to opt out of sales is this uh, is recognizing user enabled privacy controls as a as a confirmation that they want to opt out of the sale of their information. Currently, that might be the ability for a business to honor that as it pertains to a device. Um, but this was really included in the draft regs to uh, account for future technology that might enable a consumer to, to opt out across the board. Um, just one additional, I guess, complication to the intake methods for these consumer requests is when you're setting up your interactive web forms or telling your customer service representatives how to, uh, what data to collect, uh, you have to remember that an authorized agent or a parent or guardian of a minor might be the one submitting this request on behalf of a California resident. And there's different uh, items that you're going to have to collect to verify the identity of those individuals. So just keep that in mind. As to the second aspect of consumer requests, we wanted to touch at least on a few of the response requirements, not necessarily the substance of them, but the timing. Um, because this needs to be thought of holistically right now to ensure that you're in compliance come January 1. The motivation for preparing these responses is somewhat tight timelines, particularly when it comes to the request to know and request to delete. The regulations require that within 10 days of that submission, uh, you need to be confirming with that consumer that you've received their request. And then within 45 days, you're going to have to verify the identity of the consumer and potentially an authorized agent or parent or guardian to the extent they're the one making the submission, and also provide a substantive response. And there is allowance um, to the extent more time is required. There's one additional 45-day extension, so a total of 90 days from the date of the submission for you to respond. But Within 45 days, you're going to at least have to provide notice to that consumer if you are going to need that additional time frame to respond. Um, and lastly, with the request to opt out, there is no verification requirement as to the identity of the consumer. Um, however, that has a 15-day requirement, re meaning you need to act on that request uh, within 15 days. Additionally, there's requirements to communicate this information to third parties. So requests to opt out of sales, you need to identify all third parties that you had sold their information to within the 90 days, or had sold their information to, and then complete that task within 90 days from the submission and um, notify the consumer once that has been completed. Somewhat similar with requests to delete, you're going to have to notify your service providers of uh, the consumer's choice to have their information deleted. Just before we move past this page, if it's taking in line with our whole, you know, you're, you're writing down your to-do list, right? These, this 10-day response that Malia was just talking about, which is up here on that slide, working on drafting what that should look like now is something that can be in your to-do list, right? It's the regs uh, talk about it, but there's some uh, you know aspects there that you're really going to have to think through because it, it talks about you know specific types of information you're supposed to be relaying to them. It kind of ties back to your privacy policy as well, and this two-step confirmation. And, and as well, I should mention, I mean, maybe you want to automate that procedure. Maybe when the request is submitted, you want it to immediately send out a 10-day a response that says, you know, here's the additional information. That way, you have peace of mind that that has been that's been buttoned up. Or maybe you want to view that 10-day response if you're relying upon an exemption as an opportunity just to say, I'm sorry, we, you know, it's covered by business to business. Thank you very much. 
these are things you should be thinking about because again, you know, January 1st, these requests can come in the door. So standing up this procedure now is something to really be contemplated. And that two-step confirmation for online requests to delete, how are you going to do it, right? Are you going to direct people to a confirmation page? Are you going to send a, a subsequent email to people asking them to click on something? You need to think that through. Um, you know, maybe you're going to do it on an ad hoc basis where you're just going to send out emails. That's fine as well. You know, this, the CCPA doesn't say, and the regulations don't say you need to do X. They leave it more vague so you can handle it as a one-off. But I think thinking through how you intend to address these aspects so that you're not caught flat-footed come January 1 is an important process that you be thinking about now. And just to follow up on the verification aspect, um, again, this needs to be considered now because you're going to have to understand what data you have and how you're going to match that consumer to someone in your database. Um, so the CCPA regulations require this procedure to be documented. This is also going to be disclosed in your privacy notice, so you're going to be tackling two things by creating this uh, documented approach. Um, there's a lot of discretion given with this verification process because obviously it's going to depend on the size of your business, the type of data that you're collecting, and the sensitivity of that data. But you need to show that you've taken a risk-based approach in coming to your verification procedure. Um, the goal obviously being to prevent unauthorized disclosure to people other than the consumer who's making that request. So there are some, uh, I guess, benefits to having accounts, password-protected accounts set up. Um, you can require those consumers who have accounts to make the submissions through the account, and then you as the business will be providing the response through their account. Additionally, you can set up a web portal, a password-protected web portal for your account holders in which they can really, have, it'll, it'll be self-service in which you have to provide all that raw data within the, the web service or web portal. Now, the type of request, um, whether the consumer is requesting, for example, the request to know whether they're asking for just categories of their personal information or whether they're actually asking for the raw data or specific pieces of personal information will dictate the standard by which you need to verify their identity. So if it is just categories, it needs to be a reasonable degree of certainty and the suggestion there under the regulations is matching at least two data points. Whereas if there's specific information, the raw data that they're requesting, it's matching at least three data points, as well as having a signed declaration from that consumer saying they are who they are. Um, and that's really for the business's protection there and keeping that documented. So this really plays into your intake forms as well as your communication after the submission as to how you're going to collect these additional data points from consumers, what data points you're going to collect, um, how you're going to communicate with account holders versus non-account holders, um, and really this drives back to the data inventory. You really need to understand what information you're maintaining on, on California residents. Um, and the CCPA is really driving data minimization here. So there's the extent you don't need to collect information outside of what you maintain, um, then you really shouldn't. And Dave touched on this earlier. Um, while we're not going necessarily through all the substantive responses at that 45-day deadline, we wanted to touch on, at this point, you should be able to draft some automated, not automated responses, but have a draft ready to the extent the information that's being requested is otherwise exempt under the CCPA. Because even though your data may be exempt under GLBA or business-to-business -business exception, you still need to have these intake methods set up, and you still need to comply with the response timelines under the CCPA, even though your response will essentially be saying that your data is exempt and therefore you don't need to disclose this information. You need to have this process set up. And I mentioned earlier about for account holders, 
submitting this information through their account or setting up a web portal where it's self-service for account holders. Um, but if it's non-account holders, then it can be by mail or electronically, depending on how that consumer submitted the request. To the extent it's electronic, it needs to be in a portable and readily accessible format that can ideally be transferred without any hindrance. Um, this is applicable as well to account holders. So to the extent you have a web portal set up or you're providing this information to them behind their password protected account, um, that consumer still needs to be able to download that data essentially and, and be able to have it in a portable format. Um, one caveat here is that never are you supposed to be disclosing sensitive personal information. Um, that includes social security numbers, financial account credentials, medical info. Um, this is all set forth under the uh, regulations, the proposed regulations. Lastly, we just wanted to touch on when it comes to these consumer requests, there are now record keeping requirements under the proposed regulations. Um, really, you need to be documenting the nature of the request, when it was received, and how you as a business are handling that and the response that was given. This information is going to be required to be maintained for 24 months. Um, it is otherwise exempt from the CCPA um, to the extent you're maintaining this information strictly for complying with the record keeping obligations. Um, but something to think of to the extent you have service providers collecting personal information directly from consumers on your behalf, if they're unable to, be, to comply with these requests, um, then they're going to be directing the consumer to you um, to follow through with responding to these requests. But just to tie the consumer request section of this presentation up, again, you really need to be thinking about this holistically and involving legal and IT um, to ensure you have the functionality to operate, operationalize uh, these obligations. And Bob is going to talk a little bit about uh, notice requirements. All right, so let's get into this. Um, so the CCPA requires uh, various types of notice depending on what you're doing. There is a notice of a collection, uh, an employee notice, uh, your online privacy notice or privacy policy, notice of the right to opt out, uh, notice of financial incentive, and hard copy notices to the extent you're, you're dealing with brick and mortar customers and collecting information um, at, a, at a retail outlet, uh, this, the hard copy notices may be used to notice at collection. Um, so we'll start uh, notice at, at collection. So, you know, uh, when the regs came out, uh, our last webinar in October, we provided specific requirements on this. And just for the sake of time, because there's a lot of material here, um, there's actually a hyperlink to that recording, uh, and you can and check that out. Um, but the method of providing the notice of collection is that the notice be visible or accessible where, where consumers will see it before any personal information is collected. Um, obviously, especially when you're dealing with websites, this becomes a little um, concerning because a lot of the times the cookies are inserted on someone's uh, computer and collecting information. Uh, within nanoseconds of someone logging into a website. Um, so for that perspective, you know, right now we're kind of looking at um, considering the use of a, of a footer or a pop-up notice or just-in-time notice, similar to kind of when you log into a website. There's a cookies notice now that could be modified uh, to provide the notice of what uh, data that, that the cookies are collecting um, as someone enters a site. Um, you know, and those those will need to be personalized. Again, where the data inventory comes in is is what sort of data are those cookies collecting, so that you can provide the category of information and your business purpose, um, which are some of the requirements for this notice. 
another option is you can link to the appropriate section of, of the privacy policy that has this information. Now note, um, previously we just recommended generally providing a link to the privacy policy when you were giving a notice. The CCPA, um, the regs clearly show that that general link to a privacy policy is not sufficient. It's going to have to be a targeted link so that when someone clicks on that link, it goes directly to the section that provides that information. So that's kind of a little uh, quirk that we've noticed. Um, the employee notice. So while there is an employee uh, exemption in the uh, CCPA currently, um, the exemption does not apply to a business's obligation in section 1798-100, or that is the, um, and you see the text of that law there, but essentially you must inform consumers, in this case, uh, the employees as to the categories of personal information to be collected and the purposes for which the categories of personal information shall be used. Um, and so we're suggesting some sort of notice be incorporated into uh, employee application forms, other forms, uh, as you are collecting information from employees, stating you know what categories of information you're collecting, that's probably self-evident from uh, a form if it's you know name and some other information, but also the business purpose. Now you know just keep in mind this is limited to California uh, residing employees, um, but just be aware that because there's an employee exemption, it does not exempt you from all of the obligations under the CCU. CPA, just particular ones. There's your online privacy notice. Again, uh, in our October webinar, we went through the specific requirements. Um, you know, one of the considerations or options I think that we've heard discussed is kind of a California uh, versus the world approach. Um, it's sometimes tempting. Uh, I believe to make one privacy policy that apply, applies to everybody across the board. Uh, I think from an operational administrative um, perspective that sometimes makes sense and that there's no different standards for different users. Um, you know, just we want to caution against that uh, a little bit and just make sure you know what you're getting into. Um, you know, the California statute or the CCPA has specific uh, enforcement mechanisms and specific remedies for violations of the law, um, other states do not. So if you do not comply with what's in your written privacy notice um, to a resident in California, they will enforce that through the AG's office. If, if you do that with someone in another state that doesn't have the statute that governs how you collect and use their information, you know, that's probably likely a, a, a tort claim. Um, either fraud or um, unfair competition or some other uh, court or other uh, or regulatory FTC compliance. So just make sure that, you know, you kind of know what you're getting into and you think that through. Again, the CCPA does not um, override or supersede other considerations, particularly other California laws like CALAPA uh, shine a light. You know, obviously it won't uh, supersede other states' laws, the GDPR or the children. Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. So, you know, those things still need to be considered when you're drafting your privacy notice. Um, turn now to David to get back yeah. to uh, service provider agreement. Thanks, Bob. So, uh, we'll go through this one quick, quickly, but, you know, listen, here's a deal. If you've heard it before, uh, you know it already, but just to reiterate it, you know, the, the CCPA has a distinction between third parties and service providers, right? Um, and essentially, you know, to oversimplify everything here, um, if, if it's a third party vis-a-vis -vis you, it's going to have additional disclosure and opt-out requirements here, right? Um, to make them a service provider, and that's, you know, by and large, I think, you know, you have to look at it and deliberate decision, but you want to kind of, to the extent possible, pigeonhole these entities that you're transferring PI to as service providers. And to do that, you've got to look at the contract requirements, and you know, I can read it to you, but you get bored, so I'll just tell you there it is, right? Uh, you got to identify a business purpose, et cetera, et cetera, okay? What really I think you need to think about is, and we haven't started seeing a ton of these out there 
yet. We saw a lot of this with GDPR, with the data sharing agreements and the data processing agreements uh, flying around right before it went into effect. Have not seen a ton of this. We've seen it. We haven't seen a ton of this. But to be aware that when these you know, data sharing agreements are hitting your desk, to be thinking through, okay, what is it that I'm agreeing to and why? It may not say CCPA disclosure in it, right? It may say it may just have a data sharing agreement. What I would say as well, though, right, is even if you're, uh, you know, the, I, I gave you the considerations on the prior page, you're making them service providers as opposed to third parties on the CCPA, but don't just stop at those requirements. If you're going to take this step of, of ha you know, securing your data or, or, or providing contours to your data and the sharing relationship, put in other provisions as well, InfoSec provisions, breach response provisions, defense and indemnity as well. And the last point as well, I think, is, is an important one to drive home, which is if you're sitting here and you're saying, oh, well, you know, I, I, can't, I can't take this entity and I can't make it a service provider because I can't find a business purpose, right? It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be thinking about the fact that you are, in fact, transferring personal information to that entity, if you are, and addressing these issues, right? Just because you may not be able to find a business purpose doesn't mean that you should not be thinking through information security provisions and breach response provisions, indemnity provisions, right? Because there is the private right of action that's going into effect with the statutory damages. So being deliberate and thinking through this process here with service providers is really something that, you know, honestly, are you going to get this across the finish line by January 1st if you're just thinking about it now? Well, I mean, it's going to be tough, right? You have to identify these uh, with the data inventory process on the front end. But this is probably something that more likely you're going to be driving after in the next few months, um, you know, before the, the, the July 1st effective date with respect to the um, AG enforcement action. All right, so let me turn it over to Malia, who's going to give you um, a slide on training, which is often being missed here, and then we'll take you home with the takeaways. Yes, so this is also a short-term action item um, to, to some extent. So the requirement is that any individual who's responsible for handling either your CCPA compliance or just the business's privacy practices needs to be trained on all CCPA provisions and all the regulations, um, ultimately being able to direct consumers to exercise these rights. So while this may be something you want to implement throughout your organization, regardless of if they're directly handling consumer requests, some things to think about who, uh, regarding the individuals who might fall under this. Um, first, do you have customer service representatives? Are they going to be answering phones and responding to consumer requests? Do you have brick and mortar stores? Because your customer service representatives there will be, you know, the customer's first touch point. Um, and these individuals either need to be able to respond and direct consumers as to how they can exercise their rights, Alternatively, they need to be trained to not respond and otherwise direct the consumer to the website, the web form, or email address, or however you have determined to intake these consumer requests. Um, documented training programs are not explicitly required under the regs or CCPA, but um, with the exception if you are handling more than four million California residents' information, personal information, then you do need to have a documented training program. But a lot of this information is already going to be in your privacy notice disclosures, uh, your intake forms, um, and the other requirements that you're already obligated to comply with. So we, we definitely recommend documenting this and showing that you've made a good faith effort to comply. And then I'll turn it back to Dave to wrap us up with some of the takeaways. Yeah, thanks, Maria. So. And what I wanted to leave you with, uh, what we wanted to leave you with, is essentially, you know, a couple pages that you could print out to distill what we're trying to tell you into a few pages and maybe take it as your, your task list. And obviously, it's not going to be all inclusive of what you need to do from here uh, until compliance, but maybe this gets you started, right? So, number one, uh, you know, Bob talked about this right at the beginning, right? It's prioritizing the, the tasks need to be completed by January 1st. And when you think about it and, and you try to conceptualize this, uh, the, the AG's office can't enforce it till July 1st, right? But as of January 1st, the things that are really going into effect are the ability for consumers to make the requests uh, and the, the statutory damages go into effect as well, right? 
And so if you're thinking this through, what are you going to have to have in place? Well, the consumer facing disclosures, Bob talked about those earlier, your online privacy policy. If you're not drafting, start drafting, right? If you're not working on notices, start working on notices. Um, and what Malia talked about with the methods of receiving verifiable consumer requests, right? Um, thinking through that process. And then, you know, to the extent that it's possible, if you look at the subset of PI that's going to be covered by the, the, uh, uh, by the statutory damages, and it is a subset of PI, is to think about using re uh, redaction and encryption with respect to that, which are um, ways in which you can avoid those liability. Point number two, then, is um, well, let me push that over to Malia to talk you through point number two. Yeah, so just uh, certain methods or certain uh, measures you're going to take are really going to require your IT team. Um, first, as kind of part of your data inventory, understanding all your URLs, your blogs, your apps, your websites, um, because those are the forms on which you're going to have to be pushing out a lot of these notices. Um, again, how you're going to intake and respond to the consumer requests. The interactive web form is going to be required for many businesses, as all of the many businesses have a website. You need to start thinking about whether you want to automate those responses, who, whose department is going to be responsible for receiving those, as well as the record keeping system for those consumer requests. And when it comes to your privacy notices, um, are you going to have those pop ups? Are you going to be revising cookie notices? Um, to comply with this at or before point of collection requirement on this CCPA. All right, this is Bob. I'll take you through the next two. So, uh, number three on the takeaways is engage legal now. Um, you know, your online privacy policy, like Dave said, if you haven't started drafting, start drafting. But just remember, privacy policies now are should be uh, considered legal documents and should be drafted. Or, or reviewed by lawyers, at least that's the, the message from the lawyer who does this type of work. Um, so there's going to be a lot of interaction now between various laws and requirements that need to be navigated. You know, it's not just the CCPA, it's CalAPA, Shun the Light, uh, NAVAPA, DELAPA, a lot of APAs, um, CAPAs, or Kappa. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of interaction here, and so um, to the extent you don't have the expertise to navigate that, you know, there are people out there like us who do. Uh, again, draft your other notices. Uh, like Dave said, these are going to have to be uh, active January 1, so especially notice at the point of the collection, uh, your employee notice, uh, notice of opt-out of sales, and if applicable, then notice of financial incentive. I don't think I really described what that is, but just in short, um, that if you, if you, I guess an example is if you charge a different fee because someone has said that they don't want you to sell their data or they need, you need to delete their data, so there's some difference in value, um, you need to provide a notice of what that incentive is. So what, uh, what's the difference in value between using their information and not using their information? Uh, step four, the data inventory. Uh, if done, great. If not, come up with a strategy. Again, you know, uh, it's really a summary of what you collect, uh, what data you collect, and how you use it, and it will serve the basis for the rest of your compliance efforts. Um, you know, kind of as this is done correctly, it can save money preparing the necessary documents, uh, your privacy policies, your notice, your data sharing agreements, and also the right, you know, the right solution, the right approach can help you save money down the road as uh, different states come on board or, you know, in the event there's CCPA 2.0. Um, so now I will uh, turn it back to Dave uh, to wrap it up. Thanks, Bob. So, you know, the last points I'll leave you with on the checklist here is, um, you know, Malia talked about the verification policy procedure. The, the regs say you have to have a documented procedure for verification. So, you know, start thinking through that aspect there. The, the form responses, we took, talked a lot about those as well. What we're talking about is, you know, when you get these these requests, there's a requirement to have a 10-day response, right? They, they want you to, to say certain things within 10 days. Um, and then obviously you got to respond within 45 days. But navigating that process from how you're receiving it to how you're responding it to it, um, how you are going to uh, deal with the online request uh, to delete and a, and a double confirmation that's required there through form responses. That's stuff you can be working on now. 
And again, you know, this, this receiving request is something that you need by January 1. Um, I talked about contractual issues not, not too long ago, so I'll, I'll sort of just leave that where it is. I mean, come up with a method, right, for, for addressing these contractual issues to try to drive it. And then Malia talked about training necessary employees. So, uh, you know, we always talk at the end, we just have a few slides here. We, Bob mentioned the data inventory tool that we've developed at Hush. Uh, I think it's a great tool for clients to use. There's a lot of things on the market, and there's a lot of great tools out there in the market. Um, but we have something that we think that, you know, if, if you're looking at starting your inventory process, it might be something for you to take a look at. The last slide I'll leave you with then is, uh, we always call this our shameless plug slide, which is we have a block. Um, and this is how we talk to, to, to people like you out there on a regular basis in between webinars. Now we keep you up to date on things. We don't write every day. We don't write on every single piece of thing that comes out. We write on the things that we think are important for you to know to keep you up to date. And now what I'll say is, you know, we're coming into the end of the year and the legislatures, the state legislature is going to start reconvening and we're going to have a lot of legislation proposed just like we did last year. And if you want to keep on top of what's happening with other pieces of legislation or CCPA version 2.0, this is a good way to do it. At the end of the questions in the webinar, there's actually we inserted a new question now, which, you know, you can either go to the website and subscribe to this or you can you insert your email address in, in response to a question we have on the webinar response uh, questions at the end. I butchered that horribly. Uh, but in any event, we have a couple mechanisms by which you can subscribe to our blog. Well, listen, we're a minute over. Um, I appreciate you guys showing up on behalf of Bob and Malia. Hopefully, uh, we've given you some helpful tips here today. Uh, we'll hope to speak with you soon. We'll probably do our next webinar when the final regs come out. That will probably be the next one whenever that happens. But other than that, uh, good luck with your compliance efforts, and we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks. Thank you.